Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor, where we try to help people balance their, their life in all areas. Today, I'm so excited because we have a very special guest today. We have Annalise Oatman, and she is an integrative psychedelic therapist, and she's also a best-selling author, and she has a lot of information about psychedelic therapy, shamanism, and a lot of other related topics that she's going to share with you and share how powerful it could be to integrate these things into your life and what it's good for and so forth. So I'd like to give the stage to Annalise right now and have her introduce herself and tell a little about herself. So Annalise, it's great to have you on the show. I'm really excited to hear about this. So many of our listeners are so interested in psychedelic therapy and and what it is and and you know how to go about it so tell us a little about yourself sure thanks for having me on stacy it's really fun it's an honor um about myself i mean that was that was a really that was a nice introduction it's always weird to hear you know <laughs> these, these titles i'm like oh is that really what i'm doing um yeah as i was saying to you briefly before we got on um it really feels I mean even though everything that I've been doing my whole life has been leading me up to this work and and this moment of what I'm offering to people it's still very emergent because psychedelic therapy is such an emergent uh thing in the western world at least in terms of doing it legally and doing it above ground <laughs> which, mm -hmm. which I am um, some people, you know, I wish I could say I've been doing psychedelic therapy for years and years. Uh, some people have, some people have been doing it underground for years and years. Um, I never did in a formal sense. I've, I've had my own recreational experiences for years and years and plant medicine ceremony with shamans. Um, but I'm, I'm really starting to bring my own psychedelic therapy offerings to the world really this year, um, after a lot of rigorous study and personal experiences and different forms of initiation and training. So yeah, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah. So for people who don't know what psychedelic therapy is, it's very, it's a very hot topic. A lot of people are interested in it, but can you go more in depth about explaining what it actually is and what it's good for? Yeah. Um, so what it is and what it's good for, psychedelic therapy is a new emerging therapy modality, at least in the Western clinical world, where mm -hmm. there, this is, it gets a little complicated to talk about because um, typically there's one evidence-based protocol for any evidence-based therapy. And there are several protocols that have been used in the clinical trials with MAPS, for example, that act as guidelines. Um, but it's a it's an evidence-based therapy in the sense that uh, the clinical trials that are coming out are showing huge efficacy for things that people typically come to therapy for, like trauma, anxiety, depression, um, and, and other, you know, related issues. I tend to think everything has a kind of traumatic underpinning. That's my, um, that's where I come from. And that's the yeah. lens I bring to the work. Um, but who is it for? I think that was the second part of your question. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the clinical trials are starting to show things like, for example, that ketamine is really efficacious when it comes to the treatment of depression. Um, mm -hmm. MDMA is really great for PTSD. Um, what's the other one? And psilocybin, great for depression, um, great for addictions. Ketamine also can be great for addictions. However, I still think this is such an emergent field, at least as far as Western clinical sciences go, that I hesitate to kind of channel the different compounds into, you know, MDMA for trauma, ketamine for depression, because I think of it more through a trauma lens and also um, through the lens of the indigenous cultures and traditions that have been practicing 
psychedelic medicine systems for thousands of years where it wasn't so much, oh, you're, you know, you're coming in and you're going to get the, the mushroom teachers for this, you know, presentation, or you're going to get ayahuasca for this. It's more, um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a, I don't know, there's so many different ways to talk about this. I'll just say it the way I really, that I'm really thinking that there's a kind of soul sickness that's happening that the medicine, if you want to call it, that is going to help you address within yourself using your own inner healing intelligence. Um, and it's going to help you move towards greater and greater wholeness. And we could talk about that in terms of what is the the clinical diagnostic category that that person was in and how have the symptoms ameliorated. Um, mm. I really think of it like each person is so unique. Yeah. And, you know, if you want to call something a depression, it's not depression as such. It's this person's depression yeah. and the way that it's showing up for them and the reasons why in their nervous system and in their soul and in their history. And so um, I really think of it more that, that way. Having said that, I do, I am very careful when I'm assessing if someone's a good candidate for it, that doesn't mean it's for anyone and everyone at any time. Um, and I work with a medical team to um, help me in that evaluation process to make sure there's no medical contraindications either and we're really taking everything into account but anyway I just I know I just said a lot I can I could keep oh, going it. <laughs> oh, it's it's great I think you know people want to understand more about it because it's, it's starting to get it's starting to be a, a very hot topic a lot of people are interested in in it a lot of people have been doing it for a long time and it's it hasn't really been talked about it's been more hush hush and and now it's starting to come out People are starting to talk about it more. People are starting to raise awareness. And I, I think a lot of people don't understand what psychedelic therapy is. So I think it's, it's good that you're explaining it, you know, and, you know, so if a person came to you and they had some certain issues and they said, I want to try psychedelic therapy, you know, what would be your response? Hmm. If they said they had X, Y, Z struggle and they want to try psychedelic therapy. Hmm. I would say, okay, let's, let's first, you know, talk about what's, what's happening, what you're experiencing and take our time. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I wouldn't ever want to rush into straight into psychedelics with anyone right. because, you know, a lot of times trauma is when there's too much happening too fast. Yeah. Um, and so a right. lot of times, Trauma recovery is all about creating a lot of safety and trust and rapport and going as slow as the person needs to go. Um, and having said that, I'm thinking right now about the more accessible group model that I'm doing where the preparation is really compressed so that the investment for people is smaller. Um, right. so that more people can access psychedelic therapy. That's a challenge for me and for any current psychedelic therapists. Uh, but I would say, if possible, let's take our time as much as possible and really get to know each other and come to a really deep collaborative understanding of what's going on with you and um, and what your intentions are and what you're really longing for here. And, um, you know, and there's a lot of preparation and a lot of information that goes into getting ready to bring psychedelics in much more so than any other kind of therapy <laughs> I've ever right. done. So I have all these worksheets going, you know, with um, lifestyle changes <clears throat> you might want to think about a month in advance, two weeks in advance, and, you know, two days before your dosing session. And so it almost has that kind of dieta component of preparing your lifestyle and your body to receive this experience right um and yeah we go over a lot of information about what to expect even a little bit of 
and this doesn't sound so glamorous or exciting, but technical aspects of um, the music component. What music are we going to bring in? How are we going to integrate that seamlessly on the tech side and get that figured out in advance? Um, so yeah, the intentions are really important. So you basically first you find out, you know, more about each other. You draw a trust factor. You get to understand what the person's expectations are, what they're going through and what, you know, what they're looking to achieve. And then you go into the preparation aspect where they have to start, you know, changing their lifestyle a certain way so they could in order to get the psychedelics. Now, like when they're changing their lifestyle, what does that endure? Like what type of changes, you know, would, would you suggest to someone so they could have a positive experience? Hmm. You know, with, with ketamine, which is the only one that I'm currently working with because it's the only one that's currently legal. Mm -hmm. Um, there's not a ton of, uh, restriction that someone has to do in terms mm -hmm. of, um, substances or lifestyle factors that just aren't safe to blend with ketamine right but there are suggestions and um, things that people might want to try so the only one that you have to abide by see if I'm remembering this correctly because the the medical team holds this and makes sure you know people are yeah. what they need to do or holding any medications that they need to hold um, I believe it's only a couple of different ADHD medications that, that are not safe to take with the ketamine that would need to be held for 48 hours before a dosing session. Mm -hmm. um, other medications are safe to take with it. Um, uh, yeah. And I'm working very closely with the medical team on that to make sure, you know, like we've gone over everything with the client. They've then sent me their medical notes so that I know, you know, they're on this medication, they're going to keep taking it or they're going to hold it. So there's that piece. Um, it's not advised to imbibe alcohol or cannabis within the 48 hours before. Um, and I would say the 48 hours after so that you can give your brain all the you know best chance possible to um, consolidate the new neural connections um, and get a really good night's sleep for those next couple nights um, but some people like to use ketamine therapy as an opportunity to reevaluate their relationship with those substances altogether and maybe start cutting down or cutting out the alcohol or cannabis two weeks before a month before and start to notice what is arising in their system when they put that out. Cause usually if someone is using alcohol or cannabis, for example, to balance themselves on an, in an ongoing basis, there's going to yeah. be something that arises if suddenly they're weaning off of it or cutting it out completely. And so if people feel guided to, make those lifestyle changes two weeks or a month in advance. It's a way of kind of stepping into the work even earlier and getting a sense right. of, okay, this is, this is what wants to arise in my system. And I always think of it as just younger parts that are arising to be loved, right. you know, whatever that kind of sadness or ennui that someone is using alcohol to cope with or, um, or anxiety or whatever it is, fear. Um, and I know there's, always, there's always so much I could say about all of this and so many caveats. And I was thinking as I was talking about cutting out, al out alcohol, of course, if someone has a serious alcohol problem, um, it's not even advisable to do that without medical support. Right. Um, no one that I've worked with so far has a major serious alcohol. I mean, with my, with the ketamine group, um, mm -hmm. offering. No one has had that level of alcohol struggle that they would need the medical support to cut it down. Right. Um, but yeah, what else? And caffeine. Yeah. You could even evaluate your relationship with caffeine. Um, and there's no, there's no medical guideline around, or even a therapeutic guideline around having coffee or not having coffee on the day of ketamine. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I just want people to be as comfortable as possible. So if having their coffee makes them as comfortable as possible, then I want them to have it. If they think it's going to put them in a heightened nervous system state, then I'll say maybe, maybe hold it or have a half, half calf. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, there's, see, there's so many details that go into it. Um, there's a lot yeah. behind the scenes. Um, I try to make it as simple and streamlined for people as possible and to I, actually make it kind of enjoyable, you know, yeah. to, to evaluate uh, your relationship to these substances and make it almost like a retreat experience from home. You know, when, when you're going on a retreat and you're, you know, not engaging with your normal numbing or avoidance agents <laughs> so that I, you, um, come into contact with a greater degree of truth within yourself in some way so anyway so is that what the ketamine does is that it relaxes you to a state where you're able to connect with those emotions that maybe those repressed emotions or those subconscious emotions that have been really causing a lot of discomfort and holding you back in life and really causing you a lot of negative emotions within yourself it's, it's actually being able to connect with those emotions and really be able to start the healing process. Is that what the ketamine kind of does? Is that the, the benefits of using it? It can be. It definitely can be. Uh, often with ketamine or with other psychedelics, people do get to experience a repressed emotional charge mm -hmm. that they've been holding that is longing to be integrated Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not the experience people have. Sometimes people just have an experience of bliss or joy or deep peace. Sometimes people have an experience that doesn't have any strong emotional charge, but there's a, you know, they have some, some visions or some memories and it's difficult to piece together exactly what that was about. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's funny. I, I've, um, I heard a story about someone who, um, had kind of a, you know, a kind of a gnarly personality of, I'm, I'm going to go in there and have an extreme experience. I'm going to go straight into the underworld. I'm going to feel my pain and everything. And, yeah. and, uh, and this was with ayahuasca and what ended up happening is that she had an experience of joy. This is the medicine was like, uh, no, that's actually not what you need. <laughs> yeah. you need. You need an experience of joy. So it's, um, it's good to go in with no expectations, um, and to just, just receive whatever experience you're meant to have. And often it's different from anything your rational mind could have ever planned or predicted. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, if you don't mind me sharing, I, the, the most, one of the most recent times when I, I, I experienced, um, ketamine therapy for myself earlier this year, and I was nervous going in because I'm usually nervous when I'm about to ingest a psychedelic and, uh, especially because it was in a training context. So there's not a ton of time to get to know the environment and get to know the people who are going to be with you. Um, and also it was going to be an intramuscular injection. And I know that that takes you up really fast. And yes. it's the kind of thing where once it's in, that's it. You're, you're going for whatever ride it's going to take you on. Yeah. So I was nervous and as soon as I felt the effect of that ketamine taking hold, all my fear went away. And I got to have an experience of deep. I mean, I, I hesitate to even talk about it because I consider it a sacred experience and almost beyond language. I almost feel like I'm profaning it by trying to put it in words, but I got to experience the holiness that is at the center of my being and at the center of my body that is just is just love yeah and I got to relax into that and feel so safe and connected in that and 
connected to everyone I've ever loved and connected to the trees outside in this field of love mm -hmm. that covers the planet. I mean, like I had this beautiful, peaceful experience and I hesitate also to share that because I don't want people to think every experience is like that or, oh, I want, like this is heroin or something and yeah, yeah. another thing to get addicted to. Um, cause not every experience is like that. And I think sometimes the gift of that experience is that, that, that light or that love becomes a really accessible part right. of your inner world from that moment on. So that when people talk about really nice ideas, like, oh, you know, you're the essence of who you really are is love. Yeah. Part of you says yes I know that I've I've had that experience mm -hmm. um so it's kind I, of go on <laughs> it's kind of like mine. well it's this kind of a um the word for it is that it's a noetic experience so so it's it's an experience of a certain kind of um so you experience something like for example my essence is love and the experience is so profound that it stands before you as, as something you must accept as a truth. Yes. And these are, you know, I think most of us have had some kind of spiritual or mystical experience where we just felt something was true at the center of our being. And I think when you've had a beautiful experience that was a noetic experience like that, you don't even really need to try to have it again because mm -hmm. it's always there for you it's like a right. talisman I I had that experience of knowing yeah um, and I also know that if I go back to that same clinic and get injected with the same dose of ketamine I could have a radically different experience I right. was something I want to I'd rather just keep that um for what it is how did how do you feel that 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 moment when you experienced psychedel psychedelic therapy? How do you feel that changed your life in a positive sense? Did you feel that it changed your life in a positive sense? Did it did it put you on a, a pathway to new meaning or understanding of who you are or you, more about your life that you that it kind of put the pieces together? Like what did you get from doing it? That's a really good question. Um, as soon as you started asking it, my my mind connected to the next time I experienced remote ketamine therapy as part of my ongoing training and induction into doing this work. But then I also connected it to earlier experiences of um, plant medicine ceremony in Peru. And I think, I think for me, it was one experience in a string of connected experiences that acted for me like a series, like a psychedelic therapy series that I gave myself. Yeah. Um, because the recommendation with ketamine therapy is to have six to eight dosing sessions. So just mm -hmm. one wouldn't be considered a full series. Yeah. However, the way that I hold that is, you know, informed consent is an ongoing process. So if someone has one session and they say that's enough for me, mm -hmm. they don't need to do another dosing session. And I'm not going right. to, I would never pressure anyone to take more <laughs> psychedelics yeah. I feel like they need. Um, but to go back to your question, if I look at the overall arc of all of those experiences, I don't even know where to begin when it comes to how it affected me and benefited my life. Because when I started seeking out those experiences for myself, I was in a really difficult place. Um, I had been engaged and my engagement exploded um, for different reasons. And that was at a time in my life where it seemed like everyone was getting married and having babies. And all of a sudden I'm just, you know, launched out right. into the wilderness completely alone. It was a total yeah. dark night of the soul. Right. Um, and 
I went into those experiences initially not really having a deep sense or a deep commitment to mm. who I really am at right. a soul level. Yeah. And that's the reason I was lost is because I didn't I didn't fully trust myself. I didn't mm -hmm. fully know who I was. I kind of knew, but I kept forgetting. Yeah. I think I'll probably keep forgetting <laughs> in different ways um, yeah. as I go forward in life. But um, I didn't have a strong belief that if I keep peeling away the layers, that what's really here at my core is something so beautiful and mm -hmm. unspeakably sacred. I didn't yeah. have that deep understanding and in some ways you could talk about it as the connection to the heart. I started to experience it that way. And yeah. my heart almost as um, connected to some greater field of wisdom. I don't know, but I, I learned that I can't figure it all out up here. <laughs> yeah. And if I try, I'm going to keep spinning. Um, right. And yeah, it just inducted me into a, deeper more committed sacred relationship with my body mm -hmm. where I was no longer able to separate my heart from um sexual encounters with men um I realized you know that might not sound like the right thing for everyone but it was definitely the right thing for my journey yeah and I got some tests along the way of you know um uh, people kind of asking me or uh, to do that. And I knew that's not in alignment for me anymore. Right. Um, and it really put me on the path to kind of stand up inside my life again and find myself here where I am now in the woods in upstate New York in a little cabin and I actually live with the love of my life now um I just through this like deep alignment and connection I figured out okay this is where I want to be I did mm -hmm. a lot of exploring to figure that out and then oh these are the people I want to be around right. and I kind of just drew in all of that where I'm supposed yeah. to be the most aligned partner um and I have this deep unshakable sense of who I really am at my core. And yeah. I have that as a resource forever, right. um, which is good for my mental health forever, you know, yeah. to oh, definitely. so found in myself. Um, of course, again, there's more I could say about it, but, and it also kind of put me on the path of doing this work, right. Which is such an honor and, uh, I was always looking for a deeper way to work with people beyond yeah. just a talk therapy and just talking about the same story and the same issues yeah. over and over. Um, and yeah, I'm making more connections in my mind, but I'll pause if you have more questions. <laughs> no, if you want to share anything else that comes to your mind, please do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, re I, I realized as I was saying that, you know, I, I found, uh, you the place that feels like where I'm meant to be the people I'm meant to be with my, my, um, you know, uh, what's the right way to say it? I almost want to say divinely selected partner, but the, a partner who's very much in alignment, mm -hmm. um, and I realize as I say that, you know, it, um, a lot of times I think people enter their self-work or any kind of spiritual practice because they want to get those things. <laughs> yeah. If they're really honest with themselves and, um, I, yeah, I almost don't even know how to articulate this. Um, you know I what it, it is me it, is that I'm sorry. You know, what I was going to say is, you know, they say we have three brains, the, 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 the mind, the heart and the gut, and both of them are made of the same matter and the same components and that not everything just comes from our brain on our head, but it comes from the heart and it comes from the gut. 
And then also is like, you know, all those three things carry emotions. They all, you know, you have your gut instincts, you have your heart that's full with emotions, and then you have your brain who facilitates and, and puts things in, in objectively. And then you have also the back of your brain, which has the subconscious, which has the ability to store our, our repressed emotions, emotions that we might not, you know, consciously be aware of. So it seems like when you use psychedelic therapy, you were able to get to a point where you were able to connect with your heart, which is part of your brain, you know, the third, the, the second, and you were able to really acknowledge the emotions that before you had psychedelic therapy, you were not able to. So it was just, you're part of your subconscious. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think you you hit the nail right on the head. Um, and I did, I did have a session where I had to experience some really difficult emotions. Um, it definitely wasn't every single session. Um, but maybe just to, to complete the thought that I was having earlier, maybe what I wanted to say was that I hesitate to give people the expectation that if they start psychedelic therapy, now they're going to have everything they want magically yeah. coming. Right. To their life. But there's a there's a way that doing your work, really sincerely going in and doing your deep work to shift your stuff at the root. Yeah. And I think psychedelic therapy is a modality for really going in deep and shifting things at the root. I love that. There's a way that that then does attract in things that are really more in alignment with who you really are and instead of in alignment with your stuff right and like your stuff is going to keep coming up i think i don't think there's a state of being perfectly healed um yeah. and uh, anyone who says that i would be very skeptical <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah, that's, that would be my follow-up thought to that. And, um, yeah, I did, I did have a session where with, with ayahuasca where, uh, that was really, really rough. And, and I was up all night. Um, I first started to feel, I mean, I don't know if you want me to get into the details or the nitty gritty of it, but, um, I was flooded as soon as I started to really feel the effect with mm -hmm. a nervous system state that I don't even, I don't even know what emotion to call it because mm -hmm. it just felt like this really heavy, forlorn helplessness mm -hmm. and almost like a shame, self-conscious helplessness and shut down. Right. And I had to feel that and um, throughout the ceremony and as each of the medicine people came up to sing the, the Icaros, the medicine songs to me, they mm -hmm. ask you to, to sit up off of your, your mat and then face yeah. them and kind of align your body to their body and let them sing. And I kind of experienced like they're singing into your body. Yeah. Your body is receiving the energy medicine of that. I could barely get myself up to face them because I was just feeling this heavy, I mean, this heaviness. Um, I felt kind of sick too. I never actually threw up <laughs> with yeah. the ayahuasca, but I almost felt like, oh, like every time I got up, just unpleasant, heavy feeling. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then I was up all night in my private but after that, um, couldn't fall asleep because I was still feeling the effects of it. And they tell you when you're preparing to take ayahuasca that ayahuasca is very relational. So you can speak, you can talk to her even right. while you're under the influence of it. You can kind of say, Hey, what are you trying to show me? Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, I, and I said, what is happening? Like, how could I be, I asked her to please release me from this. Yes. And she said, I will let go when you let go. And, wow. 
And I said, oh, so I have to have one of those death experiences. <laughs> because ayahuasca is known for bringing on a kind, it can bring a kind of death experience. It's wow. It's been called the vine of the dead. Because um, they think you can have a death experience. You can go to the realm of the dead. Um, and I went, oh, so that means I'm supposed to have one of those death experiences. And I received this kind of like, yeah. And, and I had to just let go, release the fight. Yeah. And at that moment, again, I don't even really know how to explain this, but I felt the borders of my normal sense of self totally dissolve into this <sighs> dynamic moving being that was the rainforest that existed outside of time and space mm. and I felt myself just melt into her wow and being the vastness of that being just bl bl blew my mind like I, I don't know what happened in that moment mm -hmm. and I don't want to place it within any kind of specific metaphysical or spiritual framework yeah but in this moment what I want to say is that maybe what happened was I surrendered that pain to the great mother mm -hmm. and she just held me and my sense of self and all the constrictions around that sense of yeah. self had to just totally melt Mm -hmm. in that moment and I think in a moment of grace like that something powerful is happening right and anyway I'm sure that something really big shifted in that session I don't know what it was but yeah no for sure yeah you know you you wrote three books I think it was or you you wrote a couple best-selling books I wrote two books. I'm kind of working on one now. Um, I had an essay published with Oxford University Press. Um, it was actually in a textbook about women's studies. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I've written some books. Can you tell us about um, the books that you wrote, those two books? Sure. Um, so Heal Your Witch Wound my first full length book, I think of it as kind of a, it's a self-help book, but it's kind of a creative nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. um, and then Holy Blue, which is a poetry chat book, basically. Nice. Um, yeah. And I, I'm going through a moment actually right now in my own self-work and creative process where I had a kind of shame shutdown experience after Heal Your Witch Wound came out mm -hmm. for different reasons. I started to want to disown the ideas in it. Um, yeah. and I gave myself shaming messages about it. I received some shaming messages from other people about mm -hmm. it. Just yeah. really funny because that actually just demonstrates the main premise of the book, which is right. <laughs> like mm -hmm. anytime anyone shamed me for for make, putting that book out, they were proving the point of the book, which yeah. is that um, women, people who are socialized as women, primarily feminine identified people face special challenges when it comes to putting their work out there in the world, being fully expressed. I think we have millennia of, of shame that we're mm -hmm. breaking through in order to do that. Yeah. And it's not easy. And it it comes in waves as I've experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, in the years after that book came out, I've worked with other teachers who are teaching the same things. And yeah. I'm like, shit, how come when she says it, I think she's so cool. But when I wrote it, I want to disown it. Right. You know? And so the, yeah. what I'm working on now is it's sort of another iteration of the same concepts, but just in a more sophisticated voice. I think, I think I'm going to be haunted by the intuitions of that book, maybe for life. And I'm going to keep saying them in new ways, um, returning and trying to do it better 
you know? Right. Mm -hmm. I get that. Where can you find these books? Uh, both are available on Amazon. Okay. Um, I think if you just do a Google search, you should be able to find them. Um, All right. Now with, um, with what everything, with everything that we talked about in this discussion, what are some of the important things you'd like to emphasize? I would like to emphasize that if you feel called to do this work, mm -hmm. there's probably something in it for you. And if you right. find a practitioner or a retreat space that feels aligned and feels safe to you, that's the most important thing. Yes. Um, I think there are a lot of businesses that are capitalizing on this trend and yeah. trying to essentially turn it into um, a primarily mercenary or kind of money-making endeavor. Mm -hmm. Check your gut and trust your gut and go with the the people and the projects and businesses that are relational and that are focusing on creating safe relationships before they mm -hmm. give you psychedelics. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say to anyone who is a practitioner of psychedelic medicine that um, I, I bow to you first for doing this work. It's sacred and profound and asks so much of us. Mm -hmm. And I hope that you'll join me in doing your best to keep it accessible and to protect the soul of the psychedelic space yeah by not turning it into a completely memed capitalized i mean ugh, all, i don't even know that just all those words um yeah um and and importantly acknowledge that this is um psychedelic medicine systems are ancient Mm -hmm. and our best mentors and teachers as we continue to proliferate this work I think are the indigenous practitioners mm -hmm. who deserve to be acknowledged um, and respected and worked with as colleagues yeah uh, and consultants to make sure that we're doing this in a way that's effective and that's respectful yeah and, um and that we are engaging with those ancient lineages in a reciprocal way mm -hmm. with reciprocity for, for the lineages, for the communities they come from and for the teachers we're learning from. I like um, that. Yeah. I hope to, I hope to always do that. It's a practice. Mm-hmm. No, it definitely is. It definitely is. Now, what are some of the services you provide? Services. Um, so right now I I am offering one-on-one -on -one ketamine therapy to mm -hmm. current and you know potential new clients. Um, I'm also doing ketamine therapy groups, mm -hmm. which I'm really excited about. I have one starting this evening. Um, I just, I love, I love group spaces. I think they're so powerful. There's a certain kind of medicine that you can only receive in a group. And there's a way that we go straight into the emotions and the sacred really quickly in group spaces. Right. Um, I don't think we're meant to heal in isolation. So I'm excited about that because it's powerful and it's accessible. It's, it's more affordable than one-on-one -on -one therapy. Um. I'm also learning body temple dance from Adriana Rizzolo, who I love. And I want to start offering that um, probably in a kind of, you know, once in a while workshop sort of way, mm -hmm. but I might integrate it into the ketamine groups too. As part of integration, we'll bring in music and movement and, um, and free writing, you know, kind of expressive writing as part of the the process. 
Yeah, I could I could keep going. Those are the main ones for now, but there's always something cooking. I love it. Now, where can people get in touch with you if they're interested in this? How can they contact you? Uh, they could go to my website, which is deeperwelltherapy.com. Mm -hmm. There's a contact form on that website that they can they can contact me that way. There's also onaliseoatman.com. That's more of my writer artist website and also kind of coaching mentorship website. Um, there should also be a contact form there and they can sign up for my newsletter on either of those sites. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also on Instagram, Annalise underscore Oatman. Uh, yeah, those are the best ways. And yeah, I'm going to keep sending out information about offerings and what's cooking in my newsletter. I um, love it. Oh, and I have a podcast too. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually undergoing a bit of a renovation. It's been called a life of expression, but I'm changing it to the luminous dark. Mm -hmm. uh, so look out for that. It's on Spotify. Very cool. I love it. This has been amazing, Elise. I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and sharing this information. I hope to have you back on the show so we could talk about a lot of the other things that you, you know, focus on and, and that you do. You're amazing. And this has been very beneficial because I think, you know, people need a clearer understanding of what psychedelic therapy is and, you know, what it's capable of doing, you know, the pros, the cons and everything, you know, so people have an understanding, you know, and from a person who is a professional in the field. So I'd like to thank you so much for coming on the show, sharing your knowledge and, you know, and also taking the time to help others, you know, really tap into themselves and, and you know, really help them to move forward in life and, and, and really be in touch with who they are and understand who they are as a person. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stacey. I appreciate you. I appreciate the oh, opportunity. Same here. same here. Have a great day. You too.